Chapter 50. Hunting for answers. This way, snapped the bald man. He stepped back, keeping the dagger pressed under Murtagh's chin, then wheeled to the right, disappearing through an arched doorway. The warriors cautiously followed him, their attention centred on Aragon and Saphira. The horses were led into a different tunnel. Dazed by the turn of events, Aragon started after Murtagh. He glanced at Saphira to confirm that Arya was still tied to her back. She has to get the antidote, he thought frantically, knowing that even then the Skilna Brach was fulfilling its deadly purpose within her flesh. He hurried through the arched doorway and down a narrow corridor after the bold man. The warriors kept their weapons pointed at him. They swept past a sculpture of a peculiar animal with thick quills. The corridor curved sharply to the left, then to the right. A door opened, and they entered a bare room large enough for Saphira to move around with ease. There was a hollow boom as the door closed, followed by a loud scrape as a bolt was secured on the outside. Aragon slowly examined his surroundings, Zarok tight in his hand. The walls, floor and ceiling were made of polished white marble that reflected a ghost image of everyone, like a mirror of veined milk. One of the unusual lanterns hung in each corner. There's an injured, he began, but a sharp gesture from the bold man cut him off. Do not speak. It must wait until you have been tested. He shoved Murtagh over to one of the warriors, who pressed a sword against Murtagh's neck. The bold man clasped his hands together softly. Remove your weapons and slide them to me. A dwarf unbuckled Murtagh's sword and dropped it on the floor with a clank. Loath to be parted with Zarok, Aragon unfastened the sheath and set it and the blade on the floor. He placed his bow and quiver next to them, then pushed the pile toward the warriors. Now, step away from your dragon and slowly approach me, commanded the bold man. Puzzled, Aragon moved forward. When they were a yard apart, the man said, Stop there! Now, remove the defences from around your mind and prepare to let me inspect your thoughts and memories. If you try to hide anything from me, I will take what I want by force, which would drive you mad. If you don't submit, your companion will be killed. Why? asked Aragon, aghast. To be sure you aren't in Galvatorix's service, and to understand why hundreds of Urgles are banging on our front door, growled the bald man. His close-set eyes shifted from point to point with cunning speed. No one may enter Father Dure without being tested. There isn't time. We need a healer, protested Aragon. Silence, roared the man, pressing down his row with thin fingers. Until you are examined, your words are meaningless. But she's dying, retorted Aragon angrily, pointing at Aria. They were in a precarious position, but he would let nothing else happen until Aria was cared for. It will have to wait. No one will leave this room until we have discovered the truth of this matter. Unless you wish. The dwarf who had saved Aragorn from the lake jumped forward. Are you blind, Egreskarn? Can't you see that's an elf on the dragon? We cannot keep her here if she's in danger. Aren't you and the king will have our heads if she's allowed to die? The man's eyes tightened with anger. After a moment... He relaxed and said smoothly, Of course, Oric. We wouldn't want that to happen. He snapped his fingers and pointed at Arya. Remove her from the dragon. Two human warriors sheathed their swords and hesitantly approached Saphira, who watched them steadily. Quickly, quickly! The men unstrapped Arya from the saddle and lowered the elf to the floor. One of the men inspected her face, then said sharply, It's a dragon egg courier. Oh, yeah. What? exclaimed the bold man. The dwarf Oryx's eyes widened with astonishment. The bold man 
fixed his steely gaze on Aragorn, and said flatly, You have much explaining to do. Aragorn returned the intense stare with all the determination he could master. She was poisoned with the skill Nebrach while in prison. Only two Nivor's nectar can save her now. The bald man's face became inscrutable. He stood motionless, except for his lips, which twitched occasionally. Very well. Take her to the healers and tell them what she needs. Guard her until the ceremony is completed. I will have new orders for you by then. The warriors nodded curtly and carried Arya out of the room. Aragorn watched them go, wishing that he could accompany her. His attention snapped back to the bold man as he said, Enough of this. We have wasted too much time already. Prepare to be examined. Aragorn did not want this hairless, threatening man inside his mind, laying bare his every thought and feeling. But he knew that resistance would be useless. The air was strained. Murtaugh's gaze burned into his forehead. Finally, he bowed his head. I'm ready. Good. Then he was interrupted, as Oryk said abruptly. You'd better not harm him, Ingrishkar, else the king will have words for you. The bold man looked at him irritably, then faced Aragorn with a small smile. Only if he resists. He bowed his head and chanted several inaudible words. Aragorn gasped with pain and shock as a mental probe clawed its way into his mind. His eyes rolled up into his head, and he automatically began throwing up barriers around his consciousness. The attack was incredibly powerful. Don't do that, cried Sephira. Her thoughts joined his, filling him with strength. You're putting Murtag at risk. Aragorn faltered, gritted his teeth, then forced himself to remove his shielding, exposing himself to the ravening probe. Disappointment emanated from the bald man. His battering intensified. The force coming from his mind felt decayed and unwholesome. There was something profoundly wrong about it. He wants me to fight him, cried Aragorn, as a fresh wave of pain racked him. A second later, it subsided, only to be replaced by another. Sephira did her best to suppress it, but even she could not block it entirely. Give him what he wants, she said quickly. But protect everything else. I'll help you. His strength is no match for mine. I'm already shielding our words from him. Then why does it still hurt? The pain comes from you. Aragorn winced as the probe dug in farther, hunting for information like a nail being driven through his skull. The bold man roughly seized his childhood memories and began sifting through them. He doesn't need those. Get him out of there! growled Aragorn angrily. I can't, not without endangering you, said Sephira. I could conceal things from his view, but it must be done before he reaches them. Think quickly, and tell me what you want hidden. Aragorn tried to concentrate through the pain. He raced through his memories, starting from when he had found Sephira's egg. He hid sections of his discussions with Brom, including all the ancient words he had been taught their travels through Palancar Valley, Yazuak, Daret, and Tiam he left mostly untouched. But he had Sephira conceal everything he remembered of Angela's fortune-telling, and Solenbum. He skipped from their burglary at Tiam, to Brom's death, to his imprisonment in Gilead, and lastly, to Murtaugh's revelation of his true identity. Aragorn wanted to hide that as well, but Sephira balked. The Varden have a right to know who they shelter under their roof especially if it's a son of the Force One. Just do it, he said tightly, fighting another wave of agony. I won't be the one to unmask him, at least not to this man. It'll be discovered as soon as Murtag is scanned, warned Sephira sharply. Just do it. With the most important information hidden, there was nothing else for Aragorn to do but wait for the bold man to finish his inspection. It was like sitting still, while his fingernails were extracted with rusty tongs. His entire body was rigid, jaw locked tightly. Heat 
radiated from his skin, and a line of sweat rolled down his neck. He was acutely aware of each second as the long minutes crept by. The bald man wound through his experiences sluggishly, like a thorny vine pushing its way toward the sunlight. He paid keen attention to many things Aragorn considered irrelevant, such as his mother, Selina, and seemed to linger on purpose so as to prolong the suffering. He spent a long time examining Aragorn's recollections of the Razak, and then later, the Shade. It was not until his adventures had been exhaustively analysed that the bold man began to withdraw from Aragorn's mind. The probe was extracted like a splinter being removed. Aragorn shuddered, swayed, then fell toward the floor. Strong arms caught him at the last second, lowering him to the cool marble. He heard Oric exclaim from behind him, You went too far! He wasn't strong enough for this! He'll live. That's all that is needed, answered the bald man curtly. There was an angry grunt. What did you find? Silence. Well, is he to be trusted or not? The words came reluctantly. He is not your enemy. There were audible sighs of relief throughout the room. Aragorn's eyes fluttered open. He gingerly pushed himself upright. Easy now, said Oric, wrapping a thick arm around him and helping him to his feet. Aragorn wove unsteadily glaring at the bald man. A low growl rumbled in Saphira's throat. The bald man ignored them. He turned to Murtagh, who was still being held at sword point. It's your turn now. Murtagh stiffened and shook his head. The sword cut his neck slightly. Blood dripped down his skin. No. You will not be protected here if you refuse. Aragorn has been declared trustworthy. So you cannot threaten to kill him to influence me. Since you can't do that, nothing you say or do will convince me to open my mind. Sneering, the bold man cocked what would have been an eyebrow, if he had any. What of your own life? I can still threaten that. It won't do any good, said Murtagh stonily, and with such conviction that it was impossible to doubt his word. The bold man's breath exploded angrily. You don't have a choice! He stepped forward and placed his palm on Murtagh's brow, clenching his hand to hold him in place. Murtagh stiffened, face growing as hard as iron, fists clenched, neck muscles bulging. He was obviously fighting the attack with all his strength. The bold man bared his teeth with fury and frustration at the resistance. His fingers dug mercilessly into Murtagh. Aragorn winced in sympathy knowing the battle that raged between them. "'Can't you help him?' he asked Saphira. "'No,' she said softly. "'He will allow no one into his mind.' Oric scowled darkly as he watched the combatants. "'Ilf guards are doom,' he muttered, then leapt forward and cried, "'That is enough!' He grabbed the bald man's arm and tore him away from Murtagh, with strength disproportional to his size. The bald man stumbled back, then turned on Auric furiously. How dare you! he shouted. You questioned my leadership, opened the gates without permission, and now this? You've shown nothing but insolence and treachery. Do you think your king will protect you now? Auric bristled. You would have let them die! If I had waited any longer, the Urgals would have killed them! He pointed at Murtagh, whose breath came in great heaves. We don't have any right to torture him for information. Rajihod won't sanction it. Not after you've examined the rider and found him free of fault. And they brought us Arya. Would you allow him to enter unchallenged? Are you so great a fool as to put us all at risk? Demanded the bald man. His eyes were feral with loosely chained rage. He looked ready to tear the dwarf into pieces. Can he use magic? That is, can he use magic? roared Auric, his deep voice echoing in the room. The bald man's face suddenly grew expressionless. He clasped his hands behind his back. 
No. Then what do you fear? It's impossible for him to escape. And he can't work any devilry with all us here. Especially if your power's as great as you say. You don't listen to me. Ask Ajihod what he wants done. The bold man stared at Oric for a moment, his face indecipherable, then looked at the ceiling and closed his eyes. A peculiar stiffness set into his shoulders while his lips moved soundlessly. An intense frown wrinkled the pale skin above his eyes, and his fingers clenched as if they were throttling an invisible enemy. For several minutes he stood thus, wrapped in silent communication. When his eyes opened, he ignored Oric and snapped at the warriors. Leave! Now! As they filed through the doorway, he addressed Aragon coldly. Because I was unable to complete my examination, you and your friend will remain here for the night. He will be killed if he attempts to leave. With those words, he turned on his heel and stalked out of the room, pale scalp gleaming in the lantern light. Thank you, whispered Aragon to Oric. The dwarf grunted. I'll make sure some food is brought. He muttered a string of words under his breath, then left, shaking his head. The bolt was secured once again on the outside of the door. Aragon sat, feeling strangely dreamy from the day's excitement and their forced march. His eyelids were heavy. Sephira settled next to him. We must be careful. It seems we have as many enemies here as we did in the Empire. He nodded, too tired to talk. Murtag, eyes glazed and empty, leaned against the far wall and slid to the shiny floor. He held his sleeve against a cut on his neck to stop the bleeding. Are you all right? asked Aragon. Murtag nodded jerkily. Did he get anything from you? No. How are you able to keep him out? He's so strong. I've... I've been well trained. There was a bitter note to his voice. Silence enshrouded them. Aragon's gaze drifted to one of the lanterns hanging in a corner. His thoughts meandered until he abruptly said, I didn't let them know who you are. Murtagh looked relieved. He bowed his head. Thank you for not betraying me. They didn't recognize you. No. And you still say that you're Morzan's son? Yes, he sighed. Aragorn started to speak, but stopped when he felt hot liquid splash onto his hand. He looked down and was startled to see a drop of dark blood roll off his skin. It had fallen from Sophia's wing. I forgot! You're injured! he exclaimed, getting up with an effort. I'd better heal you. Be careful. It's easy to make mistakes when you're this tired. I know. Sophia unfolded one of her wings and lowered it to the floor. Murtagh watched as Aragorn ran his hands over the warm blue membrane, saying, Why is it heal? whenever he found an arrow hole. Luckily, all the wounds were relatively easy to heal, even those on her nose. Task completed, Aragorn slumped against Sephira, breathing hard. He could feel her great heart beating with the steady throb of life. I hope they bring food soon, said Murtag. Aragorn shrugged. He was too exhausted to be hungry. He crossed his arms, missing Zarok's weight by his side. Why are you here? What? If you really are Morzan's son, Galbatorix wouldn't let you wander around Alagaisia freely. How is it you've managed to find the Razak by yourself? Why is it I've never heard of any of the Force One having children? And what are you doing here? His voice rose to a near shout at the end. Murtagh ran his hands over his face. It's a long story. We're not going anywhere, rebutted Aragon. It's too late to talk. There probably won't be time for it tomorrow. Murtagh wrapped his arms around his legs and rested his chin on his knees, rocking back and forth as he stared at the floor. I'd, it's not a... he said, then interrupted himself. I don't want to stop. 
So make yourself comfortable. My story will take a while. Aragon shifted against Sephira's side and nodded. Sephira watched both of them intently. Murtaugh's first sentence was halting, but his voice gained strength and confidence as he spoke. As far as I know, I am the only child of the Thirteen Servants, or the Forsworn, as they're called. There may be others, for the Thirteen had the skill to hide whatever they wanted, but I doubt it, for reasons I'll explain later. My parents met in a small village. I never learned where, while my father was travelling on the king's business. Morzan showed my mother some small kindness, no doubt a ploy to gain her confidence, and when he left, she accompanied him. They travelled together for a time, and, as is the nature of these things, she fell deeply in love with him. Morzan was delighted to discover this, not only because it gave him numerous opportunities to torment her, but also because he recognised the advantage of having a servant who wouldn't betray him. Thus, when Morzan returned to Galba Torvix's court, my mother became the tool he relied upon most. He used her to carry his secret messages, and he taught her rudimentary magic, which helped her remain undiscovered and, on occasion, extract information from people. He did his best to protect her from the rest of the Thirteen, not out of any feelings for her, but because they would have used her against him, given the chance. For three years, things proceeded in this manner, until my mother became pregnant. Murtagh paused for a moment, fingering a lock of his hair. He continued in a clipped tone. My father was, if nothing else, a cunning man. He knew that the pregnancy put both him and my mother in danger, not to mention the baby, that is, me. So, in the dead of night, he spirited her away from the palace and took her to his castle. Once there, he laid down powerful spells that prevented anyone from entering his estate, except for a few chosen servants. In this way, the pregnancy was kept secret from everyone but Galbatorix. Galbatorix knew the intimate details of the Thirteen's lives, their plots, their fights, and, most importantly, their thoughts. He enjoyed watching them battle each other, and often helped one or the other for his own amusement, but for some reason, he never revealed my existence. I was born in due time, and given to a wet nurse so my mother could return to Morzan's side. She had no choice in the matter. Morzan allowed her to visit me every few months, but otherwise we were kept apart. Another three years passed like this, during which time he gave me the scar on my back. Murtagh brooded a minute before continuing. I would have grown to manhood in this fashion if Morzan hadn't been summoned away to hunt for Sephira's egg. As soon as he departed, my mother who had been left behind, vanished. No one knows where she went or why. The king tried to hunt her down, but his men couldn't find a trail, no doubt because of Morzan's training. At the time of my birth, only five of the thirteen were still alive. By the time Morzan left, that number had been reduced to three. When he finally faced Brom in Gilead, he was the only one remaining. The Force One died through various means. Suicide, ambush, overuse of magic. But it was mostly the work of the Varden. I am told that the King was in a terrible rage because of these losses. However, before word of Morzan and the others' deaths reached us, my mother returned. Many months had passed since she had disappeared. Her health was poor, as if she had suffered a great illness and she grew steadily worse. Within a fortnight, she died. What happened then? prompted Aragon. Murtagh shrugged. I grew up. The king brought me to the palace and arranged for my upbringing. Aside from that, he left me alone. Then why did you leave? 
A hard laugh broke from Murtog. <laughs> Escaped is more like it. At my last birthday, when I turned 18, the king summoned me to his quarters for a private dinner. The message surprised me, because I had always distanced myself from the court and had rarely met him. We talked before, but always within the earshot of eavesdropping nobles. I accepted the offer, of course, aware that it would be unwise to refuse. The meal was sumptuous, but throughout it, his black eyes never left me. His gaze was disconcerting. It seemed that he was searching for something hidden in my face. I didn't know what to make of it, and did my best to provide polite conversation. But he refused to talk, and I soon ceased my efforts. When the meal was finished, he finally began to speak. You've never heard his voice, so it's hard for me to make you understand what it was like. His words were entrancing, like a snake whispering gilded lies into my ears. A more convincing and frightening man I've never heard. He wove a vision, a fantasy of the empire as he imagined it. There would be beautiful cities built across the country, filled with the greatest warriors, artisans, musicians and philosophers. The Urgles would finally be eradicated, and the empire would expand in every direction until it reached the four corners of Alagaesia. Peace and prosperity would flourish, but more wondrous yet, the riders would be brought back to gently govern over Galbatorix's fiefdoms. Entranced, I listened to him for what must have been hours. When he stopped, I eagerly asked how the riders would be reinstated, for everyone knew there were no dragon eggs left. Galbatorix grew still then, and stared at me thoughtfully. For a long time he was silent, but then he extended his hand and asked, Will you, O son of my friend, serve me as I labor to bring about this paradise? Though I knew the history behind his and my father's rise to power, the dream he had painted for me was too compelling, too seductive to ignore. Ardor for this mission filled me, and I fervently pledged myself to him. Obviously pleased, Galbatorix gave me his blessing, then dismissed me, saying, I shall call upon you when the need arises. Several months passed before he did. When the summons came, I felt all of my old excitement return. We met in private as before, but this time he was not too pleasant or charming. The Varden had just destroyed three brigades in the south, and his wrath was out in full force. He charged me in a terrible voice to take a detachment of troops and destroy Cantos, where rebels were known to hide occasionally. When I asked what we should do with the people there, and how we would know if they were guilty, he shouted, They're all traitors! Burn them at the stake and bury their ashes with dung! He continued to rant, cursing his enemies, and describing how he would scourge the land of everyone who bore him ill will. His tone was so different from what I had encountered before. It made me realize he didn't possess the mercy or foresight to gain the people's loyalty, and he ruled only through brute force guided by his own passions. It was at that moment I determined to escape him and Urubain forever. As soon as I was free of his presence, I and my faithful servant, Tornak, made ready for flight. We left that very night, but somehow Galbatorix anticipated my actions, for there were soldiers waiting for us outside the gates. Ah, my sword was bloody, flashing in the dim lantern glow. We defeated the men, but in the process, Tornak was killed. Alone and filled with grief, I fled to an old friend who sheltered me in his estate. While I hid, I listened carefully to every rumour, trying to predict Galbatorix's actions and plan for my future. During that time, talk reached me that the Razak had been sent to capture or kill someone. Remembering the king's plans for the riders, I decided to find and follow the Razak, just in case they did discover a dragon. And that's how I found you, 
I have no more secrets. We still don't know if he's telling the truth, warned Safira. I know, said Aragorn, but why would he lie to us? He might be mad. I doubt it. Aragorn ran a finger over Safira's hard scales, watching the light reflect off them. So why don't you join the Varden? They'll distrust you for a time, but once you prove your loyalty, they'll treat you with respect. And aren't they in a sense your allies? They strive to end the king's reign. Isn't that what you want? Must have spell everything out for you, demanded Murtog. I don't want Galbatorix to learn where I am, which is inevitable if people start saying that I've sided with his enemies, which I've never done. These, he paused, then said with this taste, rebels are trying not only to overthrow the king, but to destroy the empire, and I don't want that to happen. It would sow mayhem and anarchy. The king is flawed, yes, but the system itself is sound. As for earning the Varden's respect, ha, once I am exposed, they'll treat me like a criminal, or worse. Not only that, suspicion will fall upon you, because we travel together. He's right, said Safira. Aragorn ignored her. It isn't that bad, he said, trying to sound optimistic. Murtog snorted derisively and looked away. I'm sure they won't be the... His words were cut short as the door opened a hand's breadth and two bowls were pushed through the space. A loaf of bread and a hunk of raw meat followed. Then the door was shut again. Finally, grumbled Murtog, going to the food. He tossed the meat to Safira, who snapped it out of the air and swallowed it whole. Then he tore the loaf in two, gave half to Aragon, picked up his bowl, and retreated to a corner. They ate silently. Murtagh jabbed at his food. I'm going to sleep, he announced, putting down his bowl without another word. Good night, said Aragon. He lay next to Safira, his arms under his head. She killed her long neck around him, like a cat wrapping its tail around itself, and laid her head alongside his. One of her wings extended over him like a blue tent, enveloping him in darkness. Good night, little one. A small smile lifted Aragorn's lips, but he was already asleep.